where it goes. So I'd like to welcome everyone to this webinar uh, that I chose to call Autism in Crises, Walking the Tightrope. And I, I, I really struggled or I really, I worked at looking for a right image that I wanted to communicate uh, today for, for this phenomenon of, of both autism and crisis at the same time. Uh, and I, 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 I first started actually with the title of Autism and Crises and How to Keep Afloat. That was my original title. And then I realized, no, I don't think that covers the whole spectrum uh, uh, of what's going on. This is too complex. This whole situation with COVID and and lockdown and uh, so I, I I thought okay the 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 one that I I chose was this idea of walking walking the tightrope and I in some ways what we want to say is that actually living with an autistic child is actually always walking the tightrope and 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 that's the whole point I think that is what exactly I wanted to communicate now I. For those of us, there's going to be some of us, and I'm going to move into with this imagery further on in this webinar, but I'm trying to communicate. Yet there's some of us right now that are feeling like, oh, I'm walking the tightrope better than I ever have, and that might well be so, and we'll explain why that is or talk about why that is. And there's some of us who are thinking like, whoa, I'm really teetering, and some of us are feeling I'm falling right off this tightrope. And that's the spectrum of what I was trying to communicate. And it's not just it's not just that in the COVID, we're feeling one or the other. We might have some days where we're feeling like, oh, wow, this is really going better than ever. And other days where I feel like, whoa, I'm just, I'm about to teeter off this tightrope. So not only does it change from from day to day or change from hour to hour, uh, it could change, you know, in the whole process of the weeks and the dynamics of what is all happening. We're all in a situation that is really disorienting and trying to keep your balance, which is what it's all about with an autistic child, trying to keep your balance is going to be challenging, even if some things are going better than usual. Although for many of us, I think we're going to be experiencing some things going a lot harder than usual. So before, just as a beginning, I wanted to talk about the normal, so to speak, type rope with an autistic child. Now I I, I don't want I don't want to explain too much right now. I just want to go with our intuitions here. For those of you who are here, who have a child at home that's on the spectrum, um, for those of you who have are working with kids on the spectrum, or those of you who have some idea of what it's like to be with a child on the spectrum, it is a tightrope at the best of times. Why is that? It's because we're always balancing um, and like I said, I'm just going to list these things right now, and then I'm going to explain why we're there. We, I'm just going to list the, this tightrope. We're always balancing between too much and too little, too too much too too much overload and too much retreat, too much uh, sensory stimulation, too little. Uh, and 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 that that feeling of of emptiness and vacancy that happens sometimes. And again, I'm not going to explain this right now. Just I want you to flow with me on this type of feeling. What and we as parents walk in this type of with our kids, we're we're torn all the time between this feeling of wanting to encourage and say, come, go out, go in the world, explore, do, and at the same time the impulse to say, protect. Oh, the world is threatening. Oh, it's too much. You know this this type of what is the balance? How do we do not too much, not too little, encouraging but not overloading this tenuous type rope? And, and added to that, this is just responding to the individual needs of the child. Added to that also the demands of the world, the demands of school, all those kind of external demands, going shopping <laughs> to buy groceries as an external demand, as well as responding to the needs of the child to say, I don't, that's too much for me, I need to stay home. Um, this this is the the kind of dynamic that I was trying to encapsulate in this idea of walking the tightrope under normal circumstances with our kids on the spectrum. Now, see if you, if I have a quiet voice, I'll, I'll 
Let me have a loud one for that. Try to adjust it. Maybe that's already better. Um, so this is this is the, the the kind of imagery that I wanted to activate to just get a sense of what normal life is like with our kids. It's always tenuous. It's always just trying to get it approximately, always trying to adjust, always trying to get a sense of balance so that we sort of stay on this small line of making things work. Now, why is that so? And I don't want to spend too much, too much time uh, on an explanation of what autism is, but still, I feel like I do need to review it, um, and and so that that we can really sort of let it sink in why this is so. Why being with kids on the spectrum is always a tightrope walk. And what I'm going to start here is this picture of a brain. First and foremost, we need to understand that autism, in essence, or kids on the spectrum, or hypersensitivity as Gordon Neufeld describes it, is an issue of selective attention. This is an issue of a child who is not able to filter out input from into their brains, from the outside world, from the inside world, we'll talk about in that moment. But ultimately, it is an issue of not being able to filter out information. So normally, those of us who have a functioning selective or a good functioning selective attention issue, we filter out 98% of what's going on around us. And that's what we need because our brains really can't handle more in order to structure and make sense of the world around us. Now, what happens with our kids on the spectrum? And I'm trying to sort of condense this explanation. If we look at this, the point one, what's happening with our kids when information is coming into their brains way too much information is seeping through their sensory gating system. Now, when this information from the outside world first seeps through, we don't even notice it. No one notices, not even our autistic kids notice it. It goes, first of all, to our emotional brain. And this gets information that sends down to our body. So first of all, when information comes in for us, we are moved to respond to it before we even know what's going on. With our kids on the spectrum, the information that's coming into their brains is so loud and so much too much that the information being sent to their bodies is also heightenedly increased. And what happens then? What happens then is that feedback from the body is coming back. So it's not just feedback coming up from the outside, but feedback coming also from the inside. This is what we need, this feedback, in order to identify what's happening to me, what am I feeling, what is going on. This is then sent to the thinking brain, and this is where we make sense of things. But what happens when you have a filter issue where the information that's coming in from the body is so loud, is so overwhelming, that we no longer can differentiate it. We can't differentiate what feeling have I got right now. It's like the volume is way too loud. You know when you go to a concert and you can't hear the melody anymore? That's exactly what's going on. It's way too loud. And suddenly the whole system breaks down. It can no longer sort. It can no longer structure. It can no longer differentiate feelings. It can't differentiate up from down, depending on how big the, sense, uh, the filter system is. So this is, this is the brain that we are talking about. Again, I'm, I'm sort of putting it to the extreme for it, depending on the, the extent of the sensory issues your, your child experiences. They're going to be having more or less of this. Less you have, you, the volume gets a little less. You're going to start feeling a bit of a melody. But if your, mel if your filters are really open, you don't hear anything anymore. And that's why this is what's happening for our kids. This is my son. My son is on the spectrum. He's, he has an Asperger diagnosis. And on the sheer daily life level, we're talking about a brain that is overloaded with chaos, with disorder. It has difficulty structuring. Um, it is, is a whirlwind. It's a tsunami, as my son always describes it, um, or, or he uses all kind of natural disasters ideas. It's a volcano. It's a tsunami. It's a, it's a hurricane. It's all that kind of extreme uh, situation that is so difficult to to make sense of and this is this is a brain that our kids are working with under normal circumstances okay we're not talking about a crisis yet our kids are kind of 
as a normal state in a kind of neurological crisis. And therefore, there's a response, a secondary response to our kids. Um, and that is, that is the second line of defense that Gordon Neufeld often talks about, which is our attachment defenses. Now, if we, if we go back, um, if I'd like to go back to the slide just for a moment, in this state of chaos, we can already imagine, I just want to, to put out there, we can already imagine in this kind of chaos, we're not, we're not going to be able to focus on the things that really matter to us. Our heart may tell us, mama is important to me, but our brain not, may not be able to focus it down, to focus on what it is, to focus on our mama, to focus on that interaction that is actually what we most want. But our selective attention issues are going to make that difficult. Our motor issues, our coordination issues are going to make that difficult. So we're already, even at this stage, are going to be starting to have attention, uh, uh, attachment issues. And then we go to the next level. In order to manage this kind of state of chaos and disorder in the brain, the brain responds with a second line of defense, and that is our attachment defense. Now, this is the level of defense that we can use, which is not dependent on having a functional filter system. It's another completely different kind of defense mechanism. It has a lot of behavioral defenses involved in it, and this is a way of sort of compensating and, and sidestepping all the filter issues that are happening on a neurological level. So we're looking at the issue of, for example, depersonalization, which is the idea of trying not to hold on to people because, you know, holding on to people, this social interaction thing, is a really complex piece of jazz that we do. It's probably the most complex piece of jazz that our brain does, which is social interaction and attachment. It needs all kind of improvisation. It needs all kind of fluidity. And this is really hard for a brain filled with chaos. So we're going to try, if we have a brain like this, to hold on to things that are more stable. That are more concrete and this is what depersonalization is we're going to try to hold on to things that are not people but maybe things like uh, a shovel or uh, um, a special topic or a computer uh, something that doesn't move around quite as much as a human being does and then we're going to move to the other level which is an alpha defense which is another way it's not it's not holding on it's a way of controlling which is another thing the brain's not doing right now. Um, it's, it's not able to control uh, all of the input and all of the stimulation and the world that's going around in this miasma of, 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 of um, undifferentiated information. And so it makes sense we need to control this. Normally, for neurotypical people, the brain does this automatically. Now, with our kids, we with our autistic kids on the spectrum, they've got to do this behaviorally. They've got to find some way to control, and they do that by taking on the alpha role. They say, "No, you're going to bring this. No, you're going to do this." You know, this is this is that that posture of I'm like, and and forgive me, but it feels that way sometimes. I'm the dictator. I have absolute power. I'm going to control the world from the outside. We need to have some understanding of this. Why? It's because the brains aren't doing it for them on the inside. Right? And the final defense is, is this defensive detachment, which is it's, it's the most extreme response, which is not trying to hold on by keeping things steady. It's not trying to control things by taking over the control. It's just by exiting. It's like saying, no, I, I, I'm retreating on this one. The defensive detachment response is saying, I'm pushing away the world is aversive, attachments are aversive to me, and I'm just going to push them away. And I'm, I'm taking the time to, to summarize this because this, is, this, is, this looks harsh from the outside. It's, it's this armor. This is why I use this picture of my son playing, playing the Tin Man from The Wizard of Oz, which was his favorite character when he was little. This is this outer armor. This is an, an, a kind of external attempt to manage the situation that our kids with, with, with filter issues do. Um, but underneath, it is an, a prof 
profound vulnerability and openness at way more than is otherwise bearable. And we need to keep that in response, uh, in mind with our kids. So they're walking all on their own just to manage life quite the tenuous tightrope. And one of the consequences of this attempt to walk the tightrope, this attempt to bring in the second line of defense to sort of keep their balance on the tightrope, is that it has consequences for our attachments. Just like the sensory issues has consequences because you can't do the coordination of the dance. In all of these things of depersonalization, alpha and defensive detachment, these are all things that are trying, their brain is trying to help them, but it is going to pay a price for their attachments. And there you see the escalating dynamic. Attachments are what we need for development. This has cascading consequences uh, for our kids. Um, it, their attempts to function and manage the situation is sabotaging long-term uh, goals. And this, again, is the tightrope. This is the type of their brain is trying to walk, and this is the type of that we have to walk with them. So what we need to be doing this whole time on this normal type rock, we haven't even started talking about crises, this normal type rock is we're trying to help them do this compensation. Their brains are trying to do it. We've got to go on the side of their brains. We've got to try to help them to reduce the filter issue, reduce the sensory issues in order to keep them on the tightrope. We're going to have to try to compensate by trying to help them hold on to us, help in ways to, to help make, make attachments easier for them in all our attempt to help them stay on the tightrope. So again, this is my attempt at a very quick summary of what the normal tightrope of our kids on the spectrum is and our attempts, our tightrope walk with them of trying to, to, to help negotiate and, and do what's needed in order to keep the balance. Now, I hope that that's, that's a sufficient summary. And it is, you know, we have a whole course on this in the hypersensitivity course. I hope that gives you a sort of feeling of, of the walk, of the, of the daily life situation for those of us who are parents or even therapists or or teachers, people working in daily life with our kids on, on the spectrum. And now we've got something new coming in. In this dance of sensory overload filter issues, of defensive issues on the one hand, we've got a crisis thrown in the middle of this. Now the crisis we happen to be in right now is the COVID crisis. It brings with it some unique aspects and at the same time it brings something that is pretty basic to crises now crises with with our kids on the spectrum can be all kinds it could be starting school it could be the birth of a sibling it could be parents divorcing um, all kinds of crises that come in where this material that I'm going to present to you is relevant and applicable. And then there are some things about the COVID situation of the issue of lockdown that is, is more specific. So I'm going to, I, 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 I try to try to think, I, you know, we're all in this situation for the first time in our lives. And so I was thinking, how do I, how do I try to present this material to you? Or how do I try to, structure it down to its essence and I realize, okay, we, we're just going to have to dance together. I don't know if these are the essence things that I am uh, have pinpointed out of the COVID situation. So I welcome you to like throw in other categories, but I'm going to, I'm going to bring in these topics. I'm going to bring in uh, uh, six issues that I think um, are relevant to our particular COVID situation. And one of them that, that is thrown into our tightrope walk with our kids is the issue of change. And I did question, I did ask myself, maybe I should just say change. Maybe that's, because that's enough, you know, for our kids. That's enough. Um, we, we, the structures, daily life is different. Um, even if daily life was hard, even if daily life now is easier, 
it's still different than it was before. And that takes time to adjust to. Now, some of our kids may adjust and say, oh, now I'm walking better. But actually change in its essence throws our kids off. Even if it's good change, it doesn't matter. And there's all kinds of change in our present situation. Oh, my goodness. Like I said, there's also like all of a sudden you're not at school anymore. Now, maybe some kids think that's good. Maybe some kids are not attached. Um, but but for a lot of our kids, change as it is, is a problem. All of a sudden, mom's at home, dad's at home, brothers and sisters are at home. Okay, one could say, well, that's family, it's great. But it's change. And, and this is hard for our kids to, to adjust to, at least, at the very least, at the beginning. Now, added to this issue of change is the issue of separation. Now, we're in a lockdown. So, all of a sudden, there may be a lot of people who, who are, our kids were attached to that they're no longer able to access. Or there's a separation from, like, our routines of going out. Our kids get very attached to to structure and routines. They need that. They need that to hold on to. That's breaking away for them. What about the grandparents that maybe they were used to seeing? Uh, these are all new elements that, that are coming in, not just change in a general sense, but also the emotional level of being separated from what's important to us. And of course, added to that in the COVID situation is also this idea of threat. This is not just change of a normal kind. There's also, depending on where the kids are on the spectrum, they, they, they may be smelling like, oh, there's danger out there. There's some kind of danger. And all of us, I think, have the sense of this nebulous feeling of danger. Or how big is this danger? Is this, how do I assess this danger? The older they get, the more if they realize it has to do with sickness. Maybe I'm in danger of getting sick. Maybe I'm in danger of dying. Maybe how many of us are being thrown into the face of mortality and we're like, oh boy, we could be in trouble here. So depending, you know, some of us feel only a a small degree of threat here. Some of us feel a lot, and that would be the same for our, our kids on the spectrum as well, depending on how much they smell and how sensitive they are uh, and where they are developmentally. But there's definitely a sense of a physical threat in our present situation. And as well, I'm just, like I said, throwing out some concepts here, the concept of confinement of the lockdown, of not being able to move, of feeling imprisoned, of that tightness feeling of the present situation. Our kids have a lot of things going on for them. They have a lot of, 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 of activation that's going on their bodies and their brains. And this feeling of tightness and confinement is going to feel very threatening. Another topic I, I fantasize about was the issue of uncertainty. We don't know. We can't even tell our kids, well, next week things will be normal again. We can't even say in a couple of weeks, for those that have a sense of time, for those of the kids that are, 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 are on the spectrum, the classic autistic kids who are little, they don't have a sense of time anyway. The, the present moment is forever anyway. But those that have a, a longer sense of time, we can't even calm them with a sense, this, this is going to be over. We don't know. We don't know what this is. This is really difficult for our kids to be able to, to not have a clear sense of plan of what's going to be happening. And so no surprise, we are going to see heightened emotional activation. Look at that. We have change, separation, physical threat, mortality issues even, confinement. We have not clear when it's going to be over, and this is going to cause incredible emotional activation. And we, if you remember the brain slides, this emotional activation, that was the, those yellow arrows that I showed in the brain, this is going to be coming loud in the kids right now who don't have filter issues. So they're not only going to be suffering from the change issues on the sensory level, they're going to be suffering from the emotional issues on the bodily level. So we're going to have some problems here. Now, what kind of problems can we expect? And this is what I wanted. I, I don't want to overload you with how how intense and hor horrible this is. I, I actually want to tell you, like, hey, this is to be expected. 
as soon as we're going to have any kind of heightened issues with any kind of crisis, our kids who are already walking the tightrope in normal life, we are going to be seeing this kind of phenomenon. So on the emotional level, we're going to be seeing heightened alarm. So what does that mean on the behavioral level? We're going to be seeing more anxiety issues. We're going to be seeing phobias. We are going to be seeing physical activation, hyperactivity. We're going to seeing attempts to calm ourselves down. We're going to see self-soothing, stimming stuff, rocking back and forth, uh, talking incessantly, <laughs> oh, whatever, whether you're on the classic or the Asperger uh, direction of this. We're going to see all kinds of attempts to soothe, to, to structure, to calm the alarm issues. And we're going to be seeing sleep issues. We're going to have trouble falling asleep. We're going to have trouble staying asleep. We're going to have trouble with nightmares, um, depending on where the children are on the spectrum. This is to be expected. And I'm, I'm, I'm saying this to you to just say, don't be surprised. Anticipate them. That, that, how can it not be so? Of course it's going to be so. We're, we're going to see a lot of heightened frustration. Uh, a lot of things are not working right now. Attachment issues with, 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 with school, with people you can't see. Uh, a lot of normal routines are not working. Everything is in chaos. There's going to be profound frustration. Now, what does that bring with it on a behavioral level? We're going to see irritability. Oh, gosh, I saw that today, my son. You know, simply because I am you know, uh, was doing the webinar today, and we'll get to that in a moment, so I was a little less calming. <laughs> And sure enough, my son's irritability skyrockets within a moment. We're going to be seeing more aggression. We're seeing more attacking energy. We might be seeing more self-attack for those kids also who are um, more in the spectrum, have are, 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 are feeling more profound frustration and don't know how to express it any other way. You know, my son, when he was in self-attack, he would do a lot of biting, banging, these kind of things. Again, all I'm trying to point out, this is to be expected. We wouldn't expect to see anything else. Of course, they're going to be more frustrated. And this is the behavioral level, especially for kids who have filter issues. When the things come shooting through in their brain, it's going to come out on this behavioral level. And what we're going to also be seeing, and these are the three classic emotions uh, of separation, we're going to be see heightened pursuit. What does that look like? This is what happens when you're not able to hold on. We're not able to hold, hold on to the people we're attached to. We're not able to hold on to a stable world. And what the crazier that world gets, the more we're going to be into the heightened pursuit. That's this running after. Um, so we're going to be seeing more obsessions. We're going to be seeing more fixations. We're going to see more addictions. These are all the kind of things our kids do that they used to hold on, um, whether it be, like I said, computers or 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 uh, a blankie or a stuffed animal or a routine, anything that they can to hold on to to give them some kind of some kind of uh, stability in this chaotic situation. And for the little one, you're going to be seeing a lot of clinging, no doubt. They will be running after you everywhere. You probably won't have time to pee. You know, I remember that when my son was little, when he was going through his various crises uh, to do with school. Um, this is, this is, this is again to be expected in this situation. Now, these are these are just consequences out of heightened emotion. That's how we're talking about. Now, if we look on another level, on the sensory level, it's no surprise with all this activation that that we're going to be having the breakdowns. This is what the meltons are. The brain just goes, I can't do this anymore. And it just explodes. The child doesn't know anymore, right up from down, right from left. Um, and this is what how we understand the meltons that are connected with sensory overload. What we're also likely to see, and it's it, it, those are the big explosions, right? But what we're also likely to see is, is an attempt to, to structure in this chaos. So we're going to see more rigidity of holding on to things. And we're also going to see retreat. We're going to likely see the brain saying, I can't do this. This is like the defensive detachment. It's just saying, I can't do this. And we're also likely going to see regressions of going back to earlier states where it was safer, where it was number, where it was not. And we're going to talk about that in a moment. 
But these, I, these are the things that we're likely to see. These are a response to a child anytime, whether it had been starting school or, or a birth of a brother or sister, as I mentioned before. These are the things that we can expect to see in any kind of crisis situation with an autistic child. Um, now, what's adding to this situation uh, of change, separation, threat, confinement, uncertainty, heightened emotion for our kids is that we are in the same boat. We are also moved. We are also unstable. This situation is very threatening for us as well, and we smell things that our kids don't smell. We smell issues of financial insecurity, uh, who know, relational problems with the, with the, par uh, with the other parent, um, all kinds of added dynamics that come for us that are waiting us. So we're not just, it's not just our child who's in a crisis. We're in the crisis with our children as well. So again, what are we going to expect? And I don't need to have, no, I don't need to have gone through a pandemic to tell you what are we going to expect? And that's very clear. Our children are going to be turning to us to compensate and to hold on, but we are losing our balance as well. So we are likely going to see escalations. We are likely going to raise our voice more often than we usually do. We are likely to be less soft, less uh, accommodating as we usually are because we ourselves are feeling this tightness and this stress of, of activated emotion and less able to respond to it uh, that our kids are. And I, I, I mention this because it's like, yes, that's how it's going to be. No surprise. And I, I'm saying this also to like, give yourself a break, okay? This is how it's going to be. And it's going to be challenging. Now, I, I realize that there are some people who are feeling some positive effects, and I'm going to get to that in a moment, but I just want to emphasize first the, the, the problematic areas before I get into the areas where we might actually be seeing something positive out of the COVID situation. So I'm just give me a moment to look at my slides here for a moment. And then I will go. Now, what 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 I wanted to say now, or now, now I've worked you all up, you know what I said? Wow, this is tricky. This is harsh. And now, now I'm 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 going to move us down into saying, all righty, okay, <laughs> this is this is challenging, um, and again, some more challenging for some. Than others. Again, I want to I want to mention, and I'm going to mention this again later at the end of the presentation. Some of you might have actually quite a different situation for those kids on the spectrum. You might have the feeling of being saved by the bell. You might have the feeling of like, oh, school is closing. I don't have to go outside. Ooh. Uh, and so I want you to tell you that I I recognize that that might be part of the, your story as well. And I bet you that's a part of a lot of people's stories, but it may not be your whole story. And we're going to get to that part of it at the end. So I want to address more the, the crisis element. Uh, everything has frozen. Am I OK for other people? You wait a moment. All good here. OK, good. All OK. So. Then I'll, I will just dive forward, and I hope that uh, BJ uh, will, will find a solution for the situation they're in. Um, how do we walk this tightrope now, this, this tenuous tightrope, which is, which as I said, the best defined times is tenuous. And I'm going to take you now to a place that is perhaps a, a little uncomfortable. And, and I'm going to take you through some of the things that I think we need to be doing as, as a focal point in this crisis situation. And I don't think we can go anywhere before we start here. And that is, and I, I hate to be cliche, I know this accepting what is, is, is a cliche statement. And yet, at the same time, here we are in all this heightened activation of, of a, a crisis with our kids on the spectrum. 
and we have to first stop. And we have before because we're going to be drawn into all kinds of act, uh, uh, activation, trying to do things, trying to make things happen, and 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 anticipate. And we, we have to take the time to sort of slow down and say, "All right, this is how it is right now." We are in a difficult situation. We are not likely to be able to walk this tightrope with wonderful elegance, like some ballerina. Uh, and and we're not, and we may not even be able to stay on this tightrope. We may fall off, not just our kids, but we ourselves. This is a really tricky, thin, fine line. And we we may not be able to always manage it with the balance that we would wish for. And we may see our kids fall off, and we may be seeing problem behaviors that we recognize, having presented what I just did, we recognize as being a result of heightened activation. And we may be seeing something that's very painful to see in our kids, and that is the phenomenon when you fall off the tightrope, and that is moving into a state of regression. And I went through this with my son. I went through this with other kids that I've worked with. And when you see this process, you don't always see it coming. It sometimes is quite gradually. You see it coming, and you start feeling like this, feeling like your kid, you're losing. Your kid is falling through your fingers. You, you, there's often a state of running after, you know, the pursuit. You feel this kind of alarm. And often we get quite frustrated and angry with our kids. They're saying, hey, you could do that last week. You could do that a month ago. What's going on? You didn't used to act like this. This is like the old days. We are beyond that. And there, um, and this is often what the, the first indications of the child that we're we're running after and we're trying to hold on. And uh, and they, they're slipping back into old patterns of behavior. Or with my son, he would just he would just space out. And these are really painful to watch. They're painful to watch as a therapist, and they are really painful to watch as a parent. And um, this is a place we have to start in this process of just grieving what is. Because if we, it's not the child's fault. And if we run after and we say, hey, stop it. Stay here. Um, you're making me look bad as a parent. Look how you're behaving. Um, I, I, I thought I taught you better. And here we moving back into old toddler forms of behavior or even younger. Um, and this is where that process of just <sighs> accepting the moment the way it is we need to do this, and we need to do our grieving about this as painful as it is. And I can tell you how many times I've sat with parents and moms crying, having to accept the situation and letting go because of some crisis that has happened, and their child is regressing. I can only say that they come back. This is a situational thing, um, and still we have to meet the child where it is. So we have to let go of where we wanted our child to be, what we expected of our child to be. And we need to come alongside where the child actually is. And the only way we can do that is to, to grieve what we wish were or what might have been or was before. And, yeah, and I, I just, I feel for all of you, if you have to go through a process like that, and uh, I, I wish I could, I just want to give you the support if you are going through a stage of regression with your child to just know that it's not their fault, that retreat is necessary in states of overload, and what we need to do is go back to where they are. So that means if your child is 14 years old and is acting like a two-year-old, then you need to respond to the two-year-old um, and not say expect it to be a 14-year-old or you know, as one kind of example, you are nevertheless the answer. If they're retreating, know that you were being called upon. They're slipping through your fingers. It's still you who is the answer, even if they're not letting you feel that way. And you need to sort of slowly, slowly, in baby steps, try to find ways to reconnect 
to soften, to, to make safe. And we're going to look at some of the things that we can do to do that. But I just wanted to address that, that if you're in a state where you feel like you're your child is regressing, you're losing your child, you have to first stop and accept that that's how it is and grieve that before you can get in and get the ball rolling again. So having said that, one of, one of the most important things that we can do to help get the ball rolling again is to provide our kids with structure. Now, that's what everyone says, doesn't it? It's like, I'm not talking about behavior modification structures. Everyone says that. And I'm, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about responding to the brain of our child on the spectrum who is not able to structure and responding to that brain who is suddenly or she is suddenly thrown in a situation where they don't know up and down. There's been so much change. And what we need to do, we need to give them something to hold on to. Now, Look, look what I said. I said finding some, something to hold on to. And sometimes we have to present them with really concrete structures, and I'm going to get to that in a moment, before we can ask them to hold on to us. Because holding on to us is even harder. As I said, that's a complex jazz thing. That, that is something that they have real difficulty uh, in their attachment defenses, in their... In their um, uh, leaky attention systems of focusing on us. That's really hard. So sometimes we have to give them something to hold on to. We have to give them a structure, something very concrete, because holding on to people, although that would be preferable, and we're going to get to it, is not always the easiest first step. And when we present that structure, we have to also keep in mind there are some kids who need very, very strict structure and others who need, who are able to contain more room. Now, we would like to give room because there's a lot of emotional activation in our kids and we'd love to give them that room to explore and express. <laughs> Perhaps we would wish it for them. I would wish it for them. Um, but at the same time, there's so much activation that they need containment in order to be able to filter it. So it's finding that right amount. And that's why I, I, I pictured, I used this slide. I really struggled with the slide. How do I present to you all what, what, what I mean here? And even I'm trying to say what, what's needed is not, is, is not rigidity from us. It, it's, it's giving clear north south pole, west and east, an orientation in every day of something to hold on to. Now, something to hold on could be really practical. Now, there may be some kids who need a lot of structure. So they may need, when my son was little, he needed all kinds of like, at, at, at 6.36, we have breakfast and at 7.30 we do this and at 9.30 this is happening and so he needed a lot of structure in order to hold on. Now there are other kids who don't need that kind of structure but even if it's the smallest things now, not all of us are parents have that kind of structure in our own minds. We all have our own brains. This may be hard for some of us as parents to suddenly create a daily structure out of the blue suddenly COVID comes in and you're supposed to restructure your entire lives um this is really hard and that's why i, I want to encourage you don't don't overload yourself if it, look at just see what you can do and just give little points of orientation throughout the day if this is hard for you whether it be around meal times to have set meal times to say breakfast lunch dinner evening snack. We have hot chocolate now. <laughs> Holding on to those four poles. Uh -huh. Maybe you have a little moment of saying, this is where, um, this is where I'm going to come in and, and have a moment with you. We're going to watch a movie together. Oh, this is what we're going to do. Everyone has to find their own thing that fits to their family. But I encourage you to hold on to certain things and then hold on tight for your kids. Now, you have to work with you. Not all of them are going to be open to that. Some of them may hold on to it like a life raft. And, and I would encourage you to go with 
that right now. The kids right now need to hold on. So this is not the time to be practicing flexibility. Now, this might be something that some of our kids need some help in, in terms of flexibility, but not in a time of crisis. This is not the time to be working towards or, you know, being able to adapt to change and opening up little rooms. This is the time to hold on. Um, and I, I'm encouraging you all to, when you're in a crisis, and maybe not all of you are in a COVID crisis, but those of you that are, keep in mind, structure is what they need to hold on to. They need to hold on to you in a structured way. They need to hold on routines in a structured way. This is what is going to keep their balance. You know, so we have to, again, North Pole. Think of walking on a tightrope. So you need, you need clarity. You need to have a focus. What's coming now? What's coming next? In order to keep your balance so that you keep on this tightrope. So we need to be there, North Pole, and we need to give them repeated reminders of where North Pole is because they're going to diffuse in this time of, of chaos. So that's one point of structure. Now, the other thing we also need to structure in there, and as I said, we need to structure in some practicality. We need to structure in some relational moments, and sometimes they fall together. And we also need to see if we can structure in some play, or at least support play. Uh, because this is something that's hard for our autistic kids, isn't it? Um, they have a hard time finding that, that place of, of spontaneity and expression that play uh, uh, involves. And so this is the irony. It's, it's, it's so ironic for our kids at the best of times to say the answer for hypersensitivity, for autistic kids, for kids with filter issues is play because this is exactly what's going to be hard for them to do in the sight and state of alarm. But it is actually exactly what they need in order to to uh, give them the sense of safety and support and that bubble for their own uh, expression of the intensity of what is going on for them. So for those of you who have taken the play course, I just want to say play is a response of nature to both. Play is used as a way of, of a safety bubble to form attachments, and it's a safety bubble for letting emotional expression happen without consequences. So again, if you look at that attachment, emotion oh my goodness this is exactly where we have our problem zone so to speak with our kids on the spectrum so it makes sense that play should be the answer the question is how can we deliver it to them of course play is the answer to all the volcanic bubbling up that's happening with our kids but how do we find our way in and this is what's needed in this time now i understand that what's also needed in order to help our kids is that we need to find our own little spark, our own little play. And I'm not going to take you there right now because that's a webinar in and of itself. And if I went that road, I wouldn't get to our kids. So I'm, you know, encourage you to, to take the play course. Um, and maybe there's another webinar coming that might be something about finding our play. Um, but right now, I'm just going to go for like hoping that you can find that little sparkle in you and trying to give you some ideas of how you can access your child on the spectrum uh, in a situation of crisis. Now, the first suggestion of play I want to offer to you is the idea of playing in or playing with regression because you think actually that's a time where it's least likely to work. And it's the time when it's most needed. And I'm going to tell you a little story about my dear Anton. Uh, Anton was in a, a classic autistic child when I was working with him. He was six years old. And he went into a massive regression. At some point, we, we speculated about what that might be, although we were never really sure why. Because we not always know the reasons. Um, why our kids are regressing. Again, you have speculations, but um, it, 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 our kids are so sensitive and you never know exactly what they're responding to. What was happening for my dear Anton is that he was, he was 
freaking out. He was so oppositional. He was fighting, screaming, scratching, attacking. He has he was having to wear a diaper again because he was uh, wetting himself constantly. He wasn't sleeping. Life was a horror. And I was working with him. And he was also resisting just in his oppositionality, even working with me. Um, and so it was hard enough for me to just to get him to stay in the room with me. But once I'd established that, his willingness to come in the room with me, and that was not easy, and I won't go into that, how I managed that. But when he started coming with me, he was totally in a state of regression. He would come into the room with me, beeline to my beanbag that you see up top there in this picture, take his blankets, cover him up, and that was it. Regression. It was so, so symptomatic of the state that he was in. And so... What I did, and this is what I encourage you, if your kids are in a state of space out, in a state of regression, and in, in this physical state that my, my dear Anton was in um, at this time, I took a long time of just sitting beside him and, and, and understanding, like, okay, I may not know what's going on for you, but I am sure there's a very good reason for you and your brain to be doing this right now. And taking that time to respect that need. There is some kind of overload going on. And a lot of our kids in this COVID situation, is this overloading? This is too much. And they are going to need to retreat. And we need to give them the space to do that. I think this is really important. This is not always done. This is not a standard response. Usually when a kid is retreating, we say, we've got to pull them out. We've got to make sure. you know, that. and That's not what I'm saying. We need to come alongside regressions. And we need to support the retreat. And so I made him, made sure he was tucked in nicely in his blanket. And I took the time, I watched very carefully for, for all his different movements uh, underneath that blanket and, and tried to make, make sounds in response to show him I'm with him, I'm there. Any movement, or, or if he made a sound, I would echo his sound. And I, at some point when I had the feeling I was sinking with him, I was understanding the regression mode, then I, because I know him well, I know he loves deep pressure massages. So I, I, I slowly started like stroking him on the outside of the blanket. And I could hear from his response that he was liking that. And this is, this is the process that we need to go through in these times of retreats of going, okay, support you. I'm not going to invade you. I hear that you need that. And then this gentle coaxing, saying, this is what you like, isn't it? This calms you too, doesn't it? Yes, it does calm you too, this stroking that doing and slowly I could hear little peepses and things coming from him until finally um, I was able to make a little a play out of it the stroking I counted it and they started anticipating it and then I could see he was his movement was happening emotionally with him and there the bottom picture you see at some point he came out and he said hey yeah and I greeted him and it was such a moving moment to say welcome Welcome. I'm so happy you're here. And this is the kind of dynamic and energy we need <clears throat> with our kids when they're a state. And this is play as well. This is this is me trying to coax them out through play by stroking, giving structure, um, inviting him like, oh, uh, and this is whatever noises, whatever ways you need to do. Sometimes, you know, it's with our kids on the computer, you know sit beside and say, okay, what are you doing? Yeah. And encourage them, get into the interaction and coax them out of their retreat and their regression. Yeah. So this is one, if, if your kid is in that state, this is the journey you need to go on. Now, another really important play agenda, so to speak, I didn't want to say agenda because it shouldn't be an agenda, but a function of play with our kids is is simply playing for the sake of being together. Um, it's not to coax out of retreat necessarily, but just to enjoy together in this time. And this is so important for our kids because attachment is so hard for them. And in crisis, it's what they need most. So in the context of play, if you can just do something that if you look at this picture, this is my Tommy. Now, Tommy uh, is also classic autistic. And when I was with him, he was had totally scattered attention. He was running back and forth. He was squeaking. He was flapping. He couldn't focus on anything. And I just wanted to find a way to help him focus on me. 
and how to sit in one place. And this is what play could do for him. So while I, I did sensory stuff with him, lots of repetition. Again, stroking and deep pressure was important for him. I knew that. I knew what he liked. And this is important. Go with me. You know your child. You know what your child likes. Offer that what they like. Do they like a foot massage? Do they like a tickle? Do they like to run? What is it they like? And just try to get in interaction. And it doesn't matter what it's about. What it's about is just me and you, you and me, we're together. So finding ways of play that just support, just looking at each other and smiling at each other and laughing with each other, even if it's just for a short moment. Even it's with my little kids, I was happy when I first started working. I got five minutes of that. Wow, that was fantastic. Now, I, I'd work on getting it longer. Longer is better. But anything, when I you know, my first sessions, it's just that short moment of looking at my eyes and smiling. Wow, excellent, fantastic, depending on where your kid is at. This is the kind of, you know, start with the small things, but know that those moments of connection matter so much. Sometimes you have to start small. Sometimes you can go for the big long ones, the big long, uh, uh, hour long uh, play times with your kid if you're if you're so lucky to do that. What that gives that child is a sense of profound safety to be in connection with somebody so long. It gives them a clear orientation, uh, gives them a clear north pole, and it is that way of saying whatever happens around us, what all the separations and the craziness and all the changes having around us, you and me. We're solid. This is a, this is this is going to this is the structure. This is the the hold you and I have uh, to help you stay on this tightrope. So that's a very important agenda uh, for play. Just throw away all the other issues. Don't don't be focusing on you know developmental uh, occupational therapy issues right now in these crisis things. It's just about you and me. And let's smile and laugh and be together in this kind of back and forth that is attachment. Now, the way to get in to these things, and I've mentioned this with Anton, I mentioned this with Tommy, is to focus on whatever those kids, our kids, are, are most interested in. So the special interests our kids have, this is the way in. So if you have a child at home who's really obsessing about something right now, this is actually an opportunity. <laughs> Get into their obsession. <laughs> um, I, I need to tell you about my, my dear Ahmed here. What he was into, and you can understand, let me just describe to you. He would sit there at that window. Do you see him there? He would sit there with his blanket and his soother, and he would watch if he looked out that window. He could see an underground station. And this is what he would watch. Train coming in. Stop. Whoop. Doors would open. And then he heard beep, beep, beep. Doors would close. Shoop. Train would go away in one direction. Wait a bit. Train comes in the other direction. Shoop. Doors would open. Shoop. Sound. Boop, boop, boop. Doors would close. Shoop. Train would go in the other direction. Let's start again. Train coming in. Back. Oh, love that. Oh, he loved that. And that was so sweet. And he would just sit there and watch. And he could anticipate. It was so clear. He knew all the sounds and he knew what it meant. And he would repeat over and over at pretty much regular intervals. And this was his thing. This is what he did. So how do you get in there? Well, it really wasn't so hard. All I had to do, if you look at the first picture, is just go into his world and watch with him. The door. The beep. Closing in. Oh, off it goes. And then we would have these moments. And then I would look at him and go, oh, and I would give it a sound. And then we he would first, not right away, be looking at me. But we he knew. He could feel. We are watching the same thing. We are doing the same thing. And suddenly, if you look at the final picture, all of a sudden, we start a little game out of it. So whenever the, the underground left, we went, oh, there goes the underground. Yay! And then we would wait. And there was these moments of connections. And this was the way in. This was the way in. So in some ways, 
if your child on the spectrum is having some kind of a special special interest or a, a focus and obsession of fixation in some ways this is your your way to get in join step in share their world don't be afraid it's it this is really soothing and exciting for them and this is your way to be able to make something that matters to them share mattering with them and then all of a sudden you're in interaction very very easy way i say easy with quotation marks of finding your way in with our kids who are presently uh, in in a kind of so we say neurological lockdown neurological confinement step into where they are and move from there now for those that are on the on the on on another level uh, on the 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 asperger level let's say of of the spectrum they're going to be experiencing a lot more consciously their emotion and this is a, a wonderful element of play of just finding ways for emotional expression and again this is by going with the bent of the child what is the child into you know with my uh, this uh, my son in his various crises and usually they were school related we made all kinds of films so we made film on the top one about alarm and being scared and we made films about being heavy metal stars and all the aggression and sword fighting stuff or we made movies about people dying and, and and the grief of that and as he got older he started making music and he started being able to express all kinds of his emotions through uh playing different kinds of nirvana music or here he's playing a hurt in johnny cash style this is something we also we need to really support in our kids because think back to the beginning of our of our session today the the emotional activation that is taking place in our kids is so profound and they need more than anyone we all need this but they need more than anyway some way to get it out if they don't please don't be surprised of all the explosions and we looked at the behavioral things that are going to be popping out everywhere when the emotion doesn't find any other outlet if you find if you know some way to support that in your child and again it's drawing writing anything that you can think of to just help anything <laughs> come out any blurb of 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 relief on the emotional level is going to support staying on the tightrope for our kids and if none if all of that is too much if if you can't even play in or with the regression if if you can't play with just pure attachment of just having fun together in some kind of way if you can't facilitate any kind of emotional expression because it's all too tight because we're in a crisis and it's it's just it's too overwhelming then i would like to encourage an an emergency mode <laughs> which is also something you can do throughout the day even just when you're tired <laughs> but is just that point of being together in the same place at the same time and if you're lucky looking at the same thing this is the phenomenon of joint attention um this is the phenomenon of what's often called parallel play it, this is my husband and my son i mean they're they're looking at a computer and there's a lot of, a lot of us who say oh my goodness we got to get them away from the computer it's true there, there, there can be, there can be too much of that but if what if you can't what if you're too tired what if you can't get your child away what if you yourself don't have the energy to offer something else then or it's not even possible to bring your child away from that it's sometimes enough to just be together in the same room looking at the same thing and it sounds simple because even that can be hard you know i've had kids that i've worked with where even that is hard for some of us that may seem banal but there is that even that is something for those of you who are struggling who are feeling overloaded to know you don't have to put on a musical or put on a broadway show with your child you, you may not be able to do that your child may not want to do it you may not want it it may not be your thing but if you can at least just be together and share 
a space together and share attention together, that is already worth a lot. So, I want to just add, I'm coming very close to the end. I want to talk about the silver lining in this COVID situation. We talked a lot about all the the, the, the possible dramas that might be happening right now in your household um, with, with a child on the spectrum, with your tightrope walk and all the, the added stimuli, emotional and sensory and change and all these things that are happening. Um, but there's also, there might be a lot of us who are actually feeling like, oh, the child doesn't have to go to school. School has often been a, is usually a huge source of stress for our kids, suddenly we have more time together, suddenly we're attaching more, we're able to play more, um, there's a tremendous sensory relief, we don't have to, we're not bombarded with the outside world, so if you're experiencing times like that, um, and, and you probably are, even if, if you at times are feeling the crisis mode, I suspect that you will also be feeling times in this lockdown situation of a kind of settling in. Lockdown is not necessarily problematic for a lot of our kids on the spectrum. I certainly see that with my child. Um, now, so this is an opportunity to sort of read your child and say, oh, look, when is the amount of stimuli that works for my kid? When is it not enough? When is it too much? We can start reading and fine tuning because we have less noise right now in our lives. And we can watch our kids more closely. We can also tank them up with a lot of attachment um, for for when they have to go out in the world again there is there is something about this situation that it's not all just negative there might be a lot of things we can draw from and i encourage you to watch for the windows of that. watch for the windows in this situation of where where you can actually um, see benefit for your situation with your child your relationship and your child's sensory issues. So, as final words, just to re recapitulate what I was encouraging you to remember in this tightrope walk with our kids on the spectrum, in this situation with the COVID virus, to start first at the very beginning of just accepting what is. It's a change. It's different. It might be hard. Um, or it's going to be hard. Chances are there's going to be change. We need to find some kind of structure we need to create it out of the blue give birth to it uh, even if it's just the smallest little baby birth of structure whether it be the practical level and the relational level or one or the other however you can balance it just giving some kind of north south east west for your child and as best find some way to structure into play plays that bubble of safety that's going to be able to help in the stage of regression, help stabilize the attachment, help express the kind of emotion that's being activated. Um, and as I said, just the kind of play that is sharing a sense of attention with each other. This is going to be really important. And keep your eye open. Keep your eye open for the silver lining in some of this, especially for our kids on the spectrum. So final note in moments of crisis, Remember the tightrope. So re really, I encourage you, because I find this imagery so helpful. Remember the tightrope. Remember, when you're walking, imagine, like, really, I encourage you, think about it. Walking on a tightrope. So what do you need to do? One foot in front of the other, carefully. Small steps, small steps. And the other important point is you need a focus point. You need a focus to keep your balance, and I encourage you to be that focus point for your kids walking on this tightrope. Find a way and know that that's, that's what they're needing from you. And as a way to, to keep their balance and help you in the situation, help 